down I won't but um, you know Alfred leads a lot of projects here essentially you know whether it's lava flows uh, you know that leading us on trips in northern Arizona or exploring this uh, you know this volcanically active world Io that you're going to hear a lot more um, we consider Alfred a fearless leader on many levels and um, he's got many accolades I guess I could probably spend all night on zoom on them but we don't have to go into that um, he's a he's a quick google search away so yeah, sorry about the audio, but let me go ahead and then pull up the presentation now that we don't have um, other things in our way here. I think our um, I think our Chromecast, our Chrome, uh, kind of got in the way there. So sorry, the audio got tripped up on the casting software. We'll get back on cue here. And then I see some questions popping up, but we'll save those for one big Q&A um, after uh, Alfred's presentation here. Okay. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get on full screen. I'll mute myself and I'll let Alfred do the talking and hope you all enjoy. Okay, <clears throat> thanks everyone for your patience. So I am working on a NASA Discovery Mission Bayes-A study called IO Volcano Observer, but this is International Observe the Moon Night. So what does that have to do with the moon? Well, the moon is very ancient Back in those ancient times, when there was active volcanism, it may have resembled Io in, in some ways. Next slide. So Io and the moon are very similar in size and density. Um, there we go. Uh, both are dominantly rocky bodies. Uh, the moment of inertia is different. What that means is Io has a larger iron-rich core than does the moon. What's really different is the global heat flow. Um, that of Io is about 125 times larger than the moon today, but the ancient heat flow of the moon must have been much larger. And the moon had an ancient magma ocean, and Io may have one beneath a cooling surface uh, today. Next slide. Okay, a little bit about Io. This is a very special place. The intense volcanism is driven by tidal heating from the resonance of Io, Europa, and Ganymede. So every time Ganymede orbits Jupiter once, Europa orbits twice, Io orbits four times, they periodically line up, and that lining up of the moons tugs them out of circular orbits into elliptical orbits. And then, especially for innermost Io close to the mass of Jupiter, that change in distance from Jupiter warp changes the shape of Io periodically every 42 hours in its orbit. So that's that stretching it back and forth is the produces the tidal heating. Um, and Io is the best place to understand tidal heating, which is important in many moons and many exoplanets and uh, probably the Earth moon system early in its formation as well. Uh, so we want to understand this as a fundamental planetary process. And the advantage of Io is that we can easily measure the heat flow uh, remotely even. And by sending spacecraft, we can measure the tidal amplitude, the, the gases that are escaping from Io and so forth. There's also large scale silicate and ultramafic, I'll explain what that is, volcanism uh, on Io. 
which has been a key process on all of the terrestrial planets in the past. Um, Io is the only place where we can watch such volcanism uh, today. And then I'll talk a bit about the heat pipe tectonic end member. Uh, I'll say more about that. Uh, Io is, resides in, in the lower right, you can see a picture labeled Io plasma torus. Io is putting out gases from its volcanoes in, into Jupiter's uh, powerful magnetosphere. That magnetosphere charges those gases. So you have a plasma torus that follows Io around in its orbit. Next slide. So there are hundreds of extremely active volcanic centers on Io. And by extremely active, I mean more active than the most volcanically active over the long term volcano on Earth out of Kilauea. Uh, this plot shows some 250 hot spots with the colors proportional to the power output from the, the lava that's erupting in gigawatts, going up to more than 10,000 gigawatts. So what's a gigawatt? That's one typical nuclear power plant, <laughs> the output from it, or 10 million, 100 watt light bulbs. So lots of power being generated in Io. Next slide. So the moon today is very different from Io. The moon has about a million impact craters larger than half a mile across. Io has zero. It's the only solid planet out there with, with no detectable impact craters. There's some volcanic craters, but nothing that looks like a clear impact crater. So this is a, a dramatic difference from Io and, and the moon today. Next slide. But what about the ancient moon? It was, it had volcanic eruptions forming the Mare lava. And even before the Mare lava, all of those highland rocks were molten, molten at some point in time. It had a magma ocean. There's a painting by William Hartman of, of the ancient moon with uh, some lava fountaining, lava flows. Next slide. Okay, so what is IVO going to do? Uh, we're going to follow the heat in order to understand how tidal heating shape worlds as a fundamental planetary process. The figure on the left, the artwork is by James Keane, one of the original founders of the art of planetary science. And his various artwork and figures have been a big help to us in proposing this mission and getting people excited about it. But one of the big unknown questions in order to understand tidal heating is what is the distribution of melt, molten lava inside of Io? Because how solid rock deforms and tidally generates tidal heat and how a liquid deforms or how something in between deforms makes a big difference in the amount of tidal heat generated and the pattern globally. So there's four different models shown here. On the left side are two in which the mantle, the subs the, the rock below the lithosphere which is the rigid outer part uh, is is basically solid but with uh with veins and pockets of lava in it and the tidal heating can either be concentrated in the deep mantle which results in polar volcanism or the shallow mantle which is more equatorial on the right are two more magma rich uh, distributions at uh, the upper part is a, a magma ocean in which the lithosphere is completely detached from the, the core of, of Io, or there can be some sort of a magma sponge, which is lots of liquid, but within a solid matrix. So uh, our science objectives are to determine the degree and distribution of melt within Io's interior. A whole series of measurements will help us to answer that question. I'll, I'll say more about that. We want to understand Io's lithospheric structure how thick is it? How rigid is it? We want to determine where and how Io is losing heat, uh, determine Io's orbit evolution. And that objective is important for understanding not only Io, but Europa and Ganymede as well. Um, and, and understanding, studying Io's, measuring Io's orbit evolution is, is key to this. And that may be the best way to understand the tidal heat that may preserve 
liquid water oceans in Europa and Ganymede. And we want to determine IO's volatile loss processes and rates. So the major partners are besides the University of Arizona, we'll do science operations here, is the John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. They are going to design and build the spacecraft and operate the spacecraft and build a couple of the key instruments. Then we have also instruments coming from UCLA, uh, an experiment from JPL, instruments from Germany and Switzerland. All right, next slide. Okay, so our slogan is follow the heat. We want to observe how heat is generated in Io's interior to produce melted rock, how that melt is transported through the lithosphere and how it is erupted at the surface. And uh, here's our mascot who's very good at following the heat. What if this was earth? Here's a diagram cross section of earth and uh, following the heat on earth would mean understanding plate tectonics basically. So. We have a mantle with convection in it, where the upwelling of the convection contributes to the spreading ridges. It's actually, that's the simplified model of plate tectonics. That's not exactly right, but I won't go into that. Um, but uh, nowhere else in the solar system has plate tectonics. Next slide. Today that is. Instead, uh, Io seems to be representing a volcanic heat pipe method of cooling. So the diagram on the left here illustrates this. It seems very simple. So you have volcanic conduits, lava erupts and spreads out over the surface and cools. But what's non-intuitive about this is that it, it spreads out and cools, then, then another lava flow comes out and spreads out and cools on top of that, burying the earlier, earlier flows. So you have a series of flows that are each being, are each subsiding deeper into the lithosphere over time. And that rate of volcanic resurfacing on Io is so high that this subsidence rate is faster than heat can be conducted from the hot mantle or asthenosphere towards the surface, which means that Contrary to what you might think for a planet with lots of heat flow, it has a thick, cold, and rigid lithosphere. So this was kind of a surprise with Io. We expected a thin lithosphere, but when we saw the giant mountains on Io, we realized that couldn't be the case. And this is the model, at least that we think works to explain it. So then this becomes like a third major model for how planets lose heat. And how planets lose heat is basically what determines the tectonic style. So there can be just conduction through a solid lid. That's what the modern moon is like. Also the moon today. Uh, there's plate recycling. Uh, that's where the earth is towards, although uh, heat pipe and conduction also uh, are relevant to the earth. And then there's the heat pipe I remember that's earth today, but also the early earth and moon when they had a, a cooling magma ocean. And some other planets like Venus and Europa are floating around somewhere in this triangle. We don't really understand them very well. Next slide. Uh, so here's a, a paper that describes how when you have a magma ocean that extends all the way to the surface, it has to cool and it goes through various stages and eventually you must have a subsurface magma ocean. And that's where you, you should have this heat pipe tectonic style. So this is why uh, we think that the, the early earth and moon went through a, a style of heat pipe tectonism with a subsurface magma ocean, similar to what we think is the case on Io today. Or if there isn't a magma ocean in Io today, it nevertheless is, is still uh, has this thick lithosphere over a solidifying former magma ocean analogous. Okay, next slide. All right, so here's this picture again with four models of, of Io's interior. And we have multiple measurements to address. Here's, we have four main models for the state of Io's interior and, and multiple things we can measure. We can measure the tidal dis uh, deformation this is the gravitational signature 
as IO changes its shape, we call the, that the uh, tidal K2 number that parameterizes that. There's the libration amplitude. I should have thrown a movie of the moon's libration, which is uh, always very interesting to see. But IO librates as well, but how much it does so is gonna be very different if there's a magma ocean that's detaching the lithosphere or if there's not. Magnetic induction. So uh, Jupiter's giant magnetosphere is perturbed by IO. And if it has a highly conducting interior, magma will do that. It changes the shape of the magnetic field lines. We can measure that and interpret it. Uh, lava temperature is a function of the degree of melting in the mantle. So with around 10% melting, we expect basaltic lava. With higher degrees of melting, we expect more ultramafic lava to be produced. Ultramafic means basaltic is mafic, that's high in iron and magnesium, low in silica. Ultramafic means very high in iron, magnesium, and extra low in silica. And there's also the distribution of heat flow, which varies for the solid uh, IO model. So we have this little matrix, and with all these measurements, we can distinguish between these four models. Okay, next slide. So what are the science experiments? We have a narrow angle camera with 12 color band passes. Uh, it's, uh, parts of it are derived from the Europa, uh, Europa Clipper Europa Imaging System, ICE. There's a thermal mapper that's contributed from Germany with uh, 10 band passes in total that measure infrared wavelengths, thermal infrared. Both of these instruments are mounted on a plus or minus 90 degrees pivot. And with that, plus twisting the spacecraft while keeping the solar rays to the sun, it is solar powered, we can point anywhere we want. There's a magnetometer and plasma measurement instrument called PIMS, which together take care of the magnetic sounding of IO's interior. We have to also account for the plasma in order to interpret that correctly. There's an ion and neutral mass spectrometer to measure the gas compositions of gases escaping from IO. And then there's gravity science, which is simply from ground-based tracking, precision tracking with Doppler ranging uh, as IO flies back, as I IVO flies past IO. Uh, that uh, measurement tells us about the, the magnitude of the tides. That's the baseline mission that we proposed in step one. Now that we're in phase A, we are allowed to propose additional options. And there are two that we are proposing. One is a student collaboration widening our camera. And uh, having a student collaboration instrument is very high priority to NASA to train the next generation. It's also what universities are all about. And we're proposing what's called a technology demonstration experiment called Reflective UV Spatial Heterodyne Spectrometer, or RUSHES. This will tell us more about the, the gases escaping from IO, but also this is an instrument that has important applications in earth science, in heliophysics, in astrophysics. <clears throat> and so the purpose of this technology demonstration is to <clears throat> demonstrate that this technology works in space and therefore it's ready to fly on future missions. Next slide. So let's talk about flood lavas and let's first compare lava flows on Io and Earth. This black outline here is the largest active lava flow known in the solar system, Amirani Maui. We know it's active because we see hot spots where lava is erupting in various points around here. It's mostly subsurface lava that flows underneath the crust and then breaks out. And we see it changing over time, the shape of this. And then for comparison, here's the uh, Pu'u'o flow field in Hawaii, the longest currently active lava flow on Earth, that tiny thing for comparison, or the Lackey flow field from the 1783 through 84 time period. That's the longest lava flow documented by people who lived to tell the tale. But only 10 million years ago, which is quite recent to geologists, we had much larger lava flows. And there are 
also comparably large lava flows on the moon and Mars and Venus and Mercury as well. And here's an example from the moon of the Imbrium uh, lava flows. And um, I, I attempted to scale this figure so it's about the same scale as this image of, uh, <clears throat> of Amorani Maui. And it's very comparable in size. Next slide. Another reason we should care about flood volcanism is that there is this remarkable correlation between the ages of mass extinctions and other oceanic anoxia events with the ages of continental flood basalts and oceanic plateaus, large flood, flood lava eruptions, basically. Just perfect one-to-one -one correlation here that cannot be a coincidence at all. There has to be, you know, this, this volcanism has to cause mass extinction. Uh, now there's also the Chicxulub impact event at the end Cretaceous that happened by totally bizarre geologic coincidence at the same time as one of these uh, voluminous volcanic eruptions on the other side of the planet in India. So that's uh, lots of fun debates about the relative impacts of each one. But for a whole series of other events, we know that there were these volcanic eruptions at the same time. So we'd like to understand how these voluminous eruptions work and Io is the only place where we can go and watch this in action. We don't want one of these to actually happen on Earth to, to study. Next slide. <clears throat> So I mentioned ultramafic volcanism. That's very hot lava, rich in iron and magnesium. And this also has a very low viscosity, very runny, much more than basalt. It's, it's almost like molasses or hot molasses even. And uh, mafic lavas, as I said, correspond to less than 10% melting of mantle rocks, while ultramafic lavas correspond to more than 20% melting. And so the, the higher degree of melting is more compatible with the magma ocean in Io. And we think we've seen, we've measured temperatures, lava temperatures in Io that are extremely hot, too hot for basalt, but there's error bars on these measurements and we're not quite sure. We need to go back and do that experiment the right way. Once the melt fraction in the mantles in Io's interior exceeds about 10%, we expect magma to, to migrate rapidly. It's low viscosity, it's less dense than the solid. So that might migrate and erupt onto the surface, but it might also be trapped below the lithosphere. And as I said before, with the heat pipe model, with all of these subsiding layers of lava, the whole lithosphere is under compression. And so it might not be easy for lava to erupt through, to, to transport through that lithosphere. It can be trapped beneath it and form a, a magma ocean. In any event, we see these features on the moon, like these lunar sinuous rills, that there's been lots of puzzling over how do these form. And uh, the, the, the leading theory is that, that this is lava erosion. Now, eroding rock or previous lava flows with lava is not easy. It really requires extremely hot lava. And uh, so the, the belief is that there were ultramafic lava flows that formed this morphology. If we go to Io and I can actually see the same sort of morphology and measure the lava temperatures so forth, then, then we might have a much better understanding about how these ancient features formed on the moon. Next slide. <clears throat> So how have volatiles evolved on Io and the moon? Uh, Io, the situation is very complicated here. We have volcanic eruptions spewing out gases that creates a, that maintains a, a thin atmosphere. There's sublimation on the day side, condensation on the night side. There's also sputtering. The plasma torus that I mentioned um, is, is full of energetic uh, ions and electrons which bombard the surface and sputter it, and, and that causes uh, particles to fly off of the surface. There's atmospheric escape, 
we see that from the plasma torus and, and, and beyond. Sunlight plays an effect. It can have, cause photochemical reactions. So very complicated. What, what about the moon? Next slide. Well, the moon doesn't have really, it doesn't have an atmosphere today. It has an exosphere, but when the particles are so far apart that they don't interact with each other, it's considered an exosphere, not an atmosphere. But back in ancient times, the venting of volcanic gases could support, could have supported an atmosphere on the moon, similar to that on Io today. What would happen to the volatiles released by these Mari basalts, for example? Much of them would be lost to space, but some of them would have been sequestered in the permanently shadowed regions near the lunar poles. Uh, water, ice, and other volatiles have been detected in these permanently shadowed regions. And these are of great scientific interest for future exploration in part as a resource water for supporting you know, human exploration and activities. Uh, I consider it more of a scientific resource. It's, uh, it's a record of the past volatile activity of, of the moon. But in any event, these, these volatiles in the polar permanent shadows are, are targets of interest for future lunar exploration. Next slide. And there may have been Io-like plumes on the ancient moon. Uh, one feature in particular is this dark ring in southern Orientale. Orientale is this big impact basin that's on the limb of the moon. We don't see it very well from Earth, but it's about 154 kilometers in diameter. Here's a blow up of that. And there's a feature in the middle that looks a bit like a volcanic vent. Here's a geologic map interpretation of that. Next slide. <clears throat> and for comparison, here are some plume deposits on Io. The big red one here is called Pele. Uh, this one is, is huge, about the size of Alaska. Um, but then here was a new one that formed during the Galileo mission with a dark deposit about the size of Arizona, around 400 kilometers uh, diameter. Um, and then there's another one here that's an older one. So uh, the, the plumes on Io are quite varied. Some of them have white rings, some of them have red wings, some of them deposit just dark material in more contiguous areas. Um, this one here for, for Pilon, Patera is his name, that, that covered an area the size of Arizona. So. This is also a place where we think we, we measured lava temperatures that are as high as 1800 centigrade, extremely hot ultramafic lava, plus or minus a few hundred degrees given uncertainties. Next slide. <clears throat> so what good is Io and IVO to understanding the moon? It's a source of new hypotheses for understanding the moon, the ancient moon, such as the heat pipe model. Uh, we can watch how volcanic landforms form, uh, including uh, types that don't form today on Earth. If they resemble things like lunar landforms, like sinuous rills, then it provides a greater an analog and a greater understanding of how these features formed on the Moon. The nanobar atmospheric processes may be relevant to understanding trapped volatiles at lunar poles. <clears throat> And tidal heating, which is so prominent in Io today, may have been important to the early Earth and Moon uh, as, as the Moon was migrating rapidly outward from the Earth. And even in the present day Moon, according to some studies, um, more in the core of the Moon. And, and again, Io is the best place to understand that process. I think that's my last slide. Why don't you advance? Yep. That's it. So I will take any questions. By the way, my Zoom background is one of the entries into the art of planetary science from this year. <laughs> Uh, 
Allison, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, we are glad that you either knew the artist or knew of the art. Uh, um, and you had that uh, before we even displayed the art. So you must have known the artist. <laughs> no, actually, I just, I just saw it on the website. You did see it? Okay. Well, I didn't know if you knew her. Um, well, that's excellent. So yes, let me pull up the questions and we can start answering some of these. All right. So is it possible that Venus has a similar heat pipe geology as Io? Uh, great question. Uh, there's been lots of debate about, about Venus. Uh, we just don't understand it very well. Uh, there's, there's been suggestions of active volcanism on Venus today, not very convincing, uh, but there's certainly good evidence for at least relatively recent volcanism. It should be about as volcanically active as Earth. It's about the same size. It has the same radiogenic heat. It doesn't have tidal heating, but it's bigger, so it has more radiogenic heat. Um, and the landforms, you know, what we've seen from the Magellan mission shows these extensive volcanic features and, and uh, ridges, rift zones that are sort of like plate tectonic mid-ocean ridges, except they aren't spreading. They're just rift zones that form and then get stuck. And, and one thought is that plate tectonics can't happen on Venus because it's so hot. The surface temperatures are 700 degrees centigrade or something like that. And, and so the whole uh, lithosphere is warm and it doesn't subduct as well that way. It's not, it's not negatively buoyant. So then the question is, how does Venus lose heat? And, and there's been various ideas, one including something like the, the hot spot uh, activity with extensive volcanism that happens episodically. So maybe a hundred million years ago, Venus went through this episode where there were active volcanoes all over the place, more Io-like, and, and then it may just periodically or episodically go through that. But we, we know very little about Venus. It's remarkable. It is quite remarkable. Um... Mars has definitely stole a lot of, uh, uh, I feel like the past 20 years, maybe Venus was left left in the dust, left in the, left in the clouds, I don't know. Um, okay, uh, more to come on Venus, hopefully in the next uh, um, couple decades. So this is a question, uh, back to the impact craters, which I believe you, you mentioned, you know, we have this lack of uh, craters on Io, and they ask, would this suggest that the uh, what contributes to the lack of impact craters on Io, so you can retouch on that. And would this suggest that the surface is relatively young, or are they being transformed by tectonics? Right. So uh, first, a little history of this. Before the Voyager one flyby uh, of Jupiter, and our first good looks at all of the Galilean satellites, there were modeling done, and people figured out that this area should have been impacted mostly by short period comets but they're very influenced by Jupiter. So there's a focusing effect. And the innermost satellites like Io should get many more impacts than, than the next one out, Europa, which should get more impacts than Ganymede, which should get more than Callisto. Instead, what we saw was the exact opposite. Callisto is very heavily cratered. Ganymede has some young terrain, some heavily cratered terrains. Europa is mostly young, but has a, a good uh, assortment of impact craters. Io has none. And so that the explanation is tidal heating and that tidal heating results in resurfacing. So volcanic eruptions and or other sorts of activity, there may be a form of, of tectonic resurfacing, particularly on Europa and Ganymede. It, basically the craters are forming, but they get destroyed by competing activities. Just like Earth doesn't have many impact craters, it's because Earth is very active with not only plate tectonics, but also uh, erosion and sedimentation with our active hydrologic cycle. So it's, it's uh, the, the, the impacts have to be occurring. They just, the craters just don't, aren't preserved. Yes, and follow up to that for uh, the idea, you, you talked about this really thick, cold slab. Of course, the flow happens on the top and then it heats it. Um, so with, are they always a race, or could you theorize that there'd be some impact structure maybe left in this thick 
uh, yeah. slab or I mean, what it would is it I mean, these are such high temperatures that it's just it's going to raise things that we usually get here when we see that like we think a Behringer crater probably for our northern Arizona, you know, we can see the overturned beds, we can see the the, the destruction of the actual impact. Um, but yeah, these temperatures erase no matter what. Yeah, so, uh, you know, impacts occur and then they get covered by lava flows, but the, the crater structure is still there and it subsides along with the lava flows. And eventually it gets deep enough that that it is it does get warm from the mantle and gets mixed back into the mantle and then it's destroyed. But that can take uh, millions of years and so there should be indeed impact craters buried within the lithosphere of Io. So we need to send a drill core to Io. <laughs> well, <laughs> harder than it sounds, probably. Or or uh, rock penetrating radar if we had enough power. Yes, that's a concern out there at that distance. Um, power sources. Um, that's a whole other loaded topic, maybe um, with. RTGs and panels and nuclear and all that um, type of stuff. And uh, in the same idea then, uh, could you theorize on if there was to be a lander on IO? So one model I've seen, I don't know if this is true NASA model, but uh, fly by something, orbit something, and then land on something, which I guess we've had the Galileo flyby. So we've kind of already done that. This is the orbiter stage. Could you theorize if a heat probe would melt or is, do you think there's any materials that we could actually put a heat probe on the surface of Io safely? Right, so Io is very difficult to land on for multiple reasons. One is that it's deep within the Jupiter gravity well, so you need, you know, to, to have a Europa lander, there have been studies at JPL for this, um, you need the, the SLS. The, the Space Launch System was the giant rocket because you need to carry so much fuel to get it there, slow it down, then overcome Jupiter's gravity to get it into uh, uh, an orbit where it can land on Europa. Well, it's even harder on Io because it's even closer to Jupiter and deeper during the gravity well. So it's, it's expensive, but then uh, it's also a very hostile environment. The radiation uh, of Io is, is intense because of it's embedded in this plasma torus full of mostly energetic electrons, which isn't the radiation we normally experience uh, on Earth. It's more solar protons and solar UV. This is very different energetic electrons, but it nevertheless is damaging to electronics. So designing something to last for more than a day <laughs> is actually challenging. But And so, so then what's feasible? A probe might be feasible. You don't have to slow down you just, and you want it to impact and penetrate into the surface. And so a probe could could fly into Io. If it lasts a day, or if it lasts an Ionian day, that's the full tidal cycle from the diurnal tides as the whole surface of Io should go up and down by like 50 meters, the solid surface, because of the tides are so strong. So they, uh, if you had a seismic experiment, even in one Io day, you'd get a lot of data you could, you could do a heat flow probe, although it'd be just one local spot and, and it's quite variable across IO. So I'm not sure what that would do, but you, you know, something like that is conceivable, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. This is not your, this is one reason Mars has been explored so much is that it's a fairly benign environment for exploration, easy to get to and land on. Machinery survives a long time there. Venus is much harder and, and IO is really hard. And so as you wrote this proposal, and of course, uh, maybe uh, the follow up to this will be explain some of the phases, I'll follow up with that. But as you wrote this proposal, what type of planetary protection does IO have, if any? So planetary protection is designed to protect uh, planets from our own biologic contamination, which could then foul up our attempts to, to understand the potential uh, ET life on other planets, such as Europa, for example. So, so for the Europa lander, that's a very big concern. That you want a very clean spacecraft or so forth. For Io, they don't, they're not too worried about that. Uh, they they think that Io is not it's not habitable to life as we know it. There's very little water or, or organic material, as far as we know. 
if there is life, it's some exotic form of life where contamination by earth life, it's, it's a totally different, uh, 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 different, very distinguishable. So uh, there is still planetary protection we have to worry about for IVO because under certain dynamical scenarios, something might happen and it would impact Europa. So we have to do a certain amount of planetary protection, not for IO, but for Europa. Okay, and that comes down to um, getting into the orbit that you want and it's maintaining that orbit is really where the, that starts to play in? It, it, it plays into you know, a, a certain level of cleanliness of the spacecraft and also demonstrating a very low probability that it will impact uh, Europa. And the way we, we also have to dispose of the spacecraft at the end of the mission. So the plan is to impact IO and it will finally have an impact crater. <laughs> Measurable, hopefully, uh, or well, I don't know. Is well, um, let's see, Juno. Yeah, there's no camera probably with high enough resolution to see that with Juno. But Juno probably won't last that long into the future. Oh. But okay. when there are two other missions going to the Jupiter system, one is the Europa Clipper mission that I mentioned, and it's gonna it orbits Jupiter and makes multiple flybys of IO, similar to IVO, but for for Europa. And there's the Juice mission. This is the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. This is from the Europeans. And it tours the system and then orbits, actually goes into orbit around Ganymede. But uh, IVO could be there at the same time as those two other missions. And then it's a question of everyone hopes for an extended mission. So each mission can hope that they last long. And, and, and each one of them is, is disposed by impact into uh, its in, impact into Ganymede for, for juice for sure. And I think Europa Clipper, I'm not sure where Europa Clipper does, but in any event, somebody has to go first and the other spacecraft can watch it. <laughs> yes, Ganymede, I, it's interesting. I think, um, yeah, Ganymede and Callisto kind of don't get much attention at least for, you know, between Io and Europa. Um, the, the thought for smashing into Ganymede is just like, yeah, we know there could be no life at all. I mean, I was, we, we don't know that much about it. So it's interesting. It's like, oh, it's a trash can. It's fine. Um, so, so Ganymede, um, there's evidence for a subsurface water ocean in Ganymede, but it's much deeper. So the idea that you contaminate the surface and it's going to get down into the ocean, it's far less likely for Ganymede than for Europa. That's the distinction there. And why is Jupiter not the prime choice to throw things into? Uh, that's a good choice, yep. But uh, sometimes the orbital dynamics are different and that might not work. That might be what Clipper is planning to do though, actually. Um, uh, I don't remember actually. Okay. Um, so then thinking about, uh, you mentioned it's in this phase A, what timeline, and, and I don't know if NASA is obviously with considered this current state of the world, is are the phases, um, they're usually uh, uh, months to years apart from what I loosely understand. I'm no PI, um, but maybe you can explain the, the phase uh, process and kind of how long and how much work goes into this. Right. Uh, so um, first you propose step one, pre-phase A, and, and there were like 20 missions proposed and they down selected to four. So now we're in phase A studies and they give us money to support much more detailed phase A studies and all missions undergo a phase A. It's called the formulation phase. So this is when you really think, you don't build anything yet, but you really think through what you're going to do for the mission, what your requirements are. You might do some technology development. And uh, <clears throat> the length of phase A is, is about 15 months in the case of these discovery missions. Uh, and then they're gonna down select from these four to one or two that go forward to the later phases. And so then um, phase B is, is the preliminary, called preliminary design, phase B, C is called detailed design, phase D is called the build phase. Really you're building stuff in phase C and some stuff even in phase, phase B because you have to, but, um, and then phase E is after launch. That's the fun part where you get your science data. So, so for IVO, we, they, we're proposing to launch in January of 2029. 
which is relatively late. We, there's an earlier launch window that we decided not to propose for. Other missions are proposing for that. They select two, we would be second uh, in time. Then uh, the cruise to Jupiter takes like four and a half years. So we arrive at Jupiter in 2033, August. And then uh, we have a four year prime mission and then hopefully we have an extended mission. So you have to be patient with the outer solar system. Yes, patience is key. And I guess just to kind of bring uh, the missions that are, you know, here at the University of Arizona, uh, I mentioned, um, of course, High Rise, which Alfred is a, uh, I'll say the head honcho, uh, the PI. Um, so that's been in over for 15 years. And uh, that's an extended phase. I think it's it's several extended phases. Uh, extensions. Extensions of extensions. And then um, the other University of Arizona mission is OSIRIS-REx. I think a lot of folk are uh, familiar with that. And that's in phase E then? Yeah, that... they're in phase E and they're working towards actually collecting their sample uh, next month. That's the, the big event for them. Yes, and October 24, I think is the number in my head. Um, uh, yep. Where... And, and then I think it takes them a couple more years before they return that sample to Earth. And, and then the real fun begins for that sample science, although they've gotten all these observations of Bennu in the meantime. Yes, yes, of course. As a sample scientist, I'll be excited for that. But that's uh, pretty far out. I'll be uh, probably gone from LPL by the time that even, uh, hopefully, postdoc time. Um, but I believe uh, the Lunar Planetary Lab is getting something like a few grams of the material, if I remember correctly. And in our basement, um, they'll be able to do geochemistry and different um, electron microscopy. And, you know, yeah, thinking about patients in the outer solar system, um, you know, in the meteorite collection, we have, we have nothing essentially that we know of from uh, these moons of Jupiter. But can you comment on, you know, we, these impacts can occur? Um, should we have samples of of Io and uh, Ganymede already. Um, I'm no dynamicist, but um, where's the meteorites from these guys? Yeah, so you, we can't uh, we can't rule that out as a faint possibility, but it's very difficult for a material to move inward past the gravity well of Jupiter. Uh, any material escaping uh, Io, a lot of it impacts, a lot of it re-impacts Io. I mean, first of all. Eject, most ejecta falls back on the planet. Some of it escapes, the, the G of the planet goes into orbit and then eventually re-impacts Io. But quite a bit of the Io rocks re-impact Europa and Ganymede. But impacting Europa is interesting because you know Europa has this very clean ice shell and liquid water beneath that. And water is great for life, but that isn't all life needs. If you look at the earth, oceans of Earth, the deep ocean has, re, has very little life in it. It's all near the shorelines because that life also needs dirt. It needs other nutrient, vitamins and minerals. So Io is providing the vitamins and minerals that those uh, life forms in Europa's ocean that might exist need. Yes, uh, this is a, a uh, few getting to Earth with those samples. Yeah, that's not very likely. Okay, maybe there's a good sci-fi novel somewhere in there. Um, also, on the thoughts of your uh, when I asked about the planetary protection, and so yeah, if we were really worried about contaminating Io, you know, we just don't want something like the thermophiles on Earth to be riding along that spacecraft that can survive and like live on 18 uh, degree uh, Celsius on the surface of Io. So. Um, not too many, I guess, big worries there and shouldn't have to really think we're probably getting too much delivery from the outer solar system to Earth um, in general, but maybe more of an interplay between the two is what it sounds like. Uh, and, and any uh, samples from uh, the icy satellites that happen by chance to make their way to Earth, it wouldn't survive passage through Earth's atmosphere because they're icy. So. Goodbye, melt, vaporize. No, don't don't wait for free samples from the Galilean moons. Not yet. Okay. Well, I've often thought that the Martian meteorites are understudied. Um, you know, we have a lot of Mars chunks of Mars. Um, yes. But uh... no, NASA wants to spend ten billion dollars to return samples from Mars, but won't spend a few million dollars to even find the Martian meteorites that are in collections but haven't even been identified as from Mars. Right. 
Yeah, there's um, thousands of meteorites probably kind of waiting to be classified or uh, unclassified sitting through, waiting to go through different labs. I know ASU, uh, which this is another neat component about Alfred, is that he's been a part of ASU, NAU, and U of A. Um, and so maybe you could talk, there's a big meteorite collection at ASU. Sadly, we don't have one of our own at the U of A. We do. We do. There's a meteorite center in the Drake's, Drake building that Marvin Kilgore has collected. It includes, it includes boxes and boxes of, of North Africa meteorites that are, that are unanalyzed. There are almost certainly Martian meteorites in there, but they all look like rocks and you can't tell by looking at them. You need, you need to do more detailed analyses of them and that costs money. And for lack of that money, we don't even know you know, how many Martian meteorites are sitting in boxes in the Drake building at the university. <laughs> okay. Yes, I guess that is a, a interesting point is that it's a, yeah, um, a Kilgore collection, um, but it still belongs to him. He, he hasn't actually turned it over to the U of A, but I think we're lucky enough to host it over right. at where the operations for OSIRIS-REx are. <laughs> um, uh, which another uh, neat plug for the Art of Planetary Science is that building has seen two large murals, uh, both for the Phoenix mission um, and then also the OSIRIS-REx. And so uh, graduate students from uh, the art department actually made those murals. So that's kind of a cool Tucson mural um, if you ever want to see. And uh, the Phoenix, uh, they didn't paint over them. So the Phoenix is still on one side and OSIRIS-REx. And we have a question um, since I mentioned a few of these U of A roles. Um, uh, the asker says, any roles for U of A in these missions? And so I kind of alluded to that a little bit with OSIRIS-REx, but I believe Alfred, you probably know a little bit of the Phoenix history as well. I think that was a big um, role for the U of A with Phoenix, or or maybe that was when you had just transferred here. I know. No, I, I was here. That was uh, that was led by Peter Smith uh, from University of Arizona. This was the center of, of activity after after landing. Uh, the spacecraft was built by Lockheed Martin and and operated by JPL. But after landing, U of A owned that mission pretty much, and. Uh, um, and that was that was what was great about that mission is that there was a previous U of A mission that's still going uh, called Mars Odyssey that included the gamma ray spectrometer that was an instrument built and led by U of A Bill Boynton and it discovered these shallow ice deposits in the North Polar region so that's where the Phoenix mission wanted to go and then uh, MRO was launched high rise got there and we were able to see that most of those places were full of big boulders. We didn't want to land, but we found the boulder free area where Phoenix did land. So we had these series of U of A missions culminating in, in the Phoenix mission. Yeah, oh, that is a fascinating history. I think that was a big, um, uh, I mean, we have OSIRIS-REx now, but it seems like uh, maybe they also, the public was interested. I, I feel like there was a lot of hype with Phoenix um, uh, around surrounding Tucson as well. And maybe it's because, yeah, there was, uh, the discoveries with um, Boynton and then also the Phoenix Lander. Um, so we, we like to brag, I think I've heard our director say we've been a part of every NASA mission, whether it's just a scientist working here or actually designing or, you know, the precursor work. We've been a part of every mission to every body in the solar system um, that's been launched. Um, maybe you can confirm or deny that, Alfred, but. Yeah, I, 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 that Mike Drake said that. 20 years ago when it was true. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure if it's still true or not, but uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of missions. Uh, yes. Well, um, I think we're wrapping up before our little transfer time here. We're going to uh, head over next door virtually to Flandro. And um, oh, we got one other uh, question for you. We, I think we can answer that. We've got time. Okay. What roles might there be for the UA in a Mars ice mapper mission? Wow, interesting question. Uh, um, there's a lot of interest from, from U of A in, in possible Mars ice mapper. We have experts in radar, uh, some of the world's leading experts in, in radar sounding here and in understanding the polar caps of Mars. And uh, there have been various proposals in the past with UA involvement. This Mars ice mapper thing that's currently happening though, kind of came out of the blue from, from the human exploration division of NASA. And they're, they want to do it really on the cheap with, 
I think it's a Japanese spacecraft with a Canadian radar mapper and very little involvement actually from the US in that. And it's just the radar instrument without the ancillary measurements you need to do it the right way. So the science community is not that excited by that mission. They're not doing it the right way. And it's not clear what's happening with that if it's gonna happen at all. But that is a mission that needs to happen eventually, especially for human exploration. We need to know where the shallow accessible ice is. And there we know it's there's lots of very clean ice very close to the surface in the mid latitudes. We'd like to find it at lower latitudes where you can survive the winter more easily uh, and the temperatures are warmer for, for human settlement and exploration. Mm -hmm. Yes, sometimes the uh, politics of others do get in the way, even for these missions. Um, there's but politics everywhere. Can't get away from that. Yeah, there's another question that I still have to answer that, um, that, that that's, uh, they're asking about Artemis, but um, is it secure from the pandemic and uncertain political future to endanger it? So um, I don't know how to answer that person's question. Maybe Alfred does for, yeah, with Artemis and uh, politics are always there. Well, there's lots of politics there. It's not funded and, and the, the pandemic is slowing down missions that are in development like Europa Clipper. <clears throat> and so that, you know, because people have to socially distance. And so when it comes to hands-on work, actually building stuff, when it comes to planning a mission like I'm doing now, we all do this remotely and it's fine. When it comes to actually building stuff, you have to be there in person and they're proceeding uh, to build these missions, uh, but they have to stage and limit the number of people that are in the clean room at one time and so forth, which slows it down. So there is an impact there on, on ongoing missions. And if Artis, Artemis ever gets going into a real development mission that, and the pandemic is still going, then it would also be an issue there. Yes, and of course, we don't wanna to touch the things that we launch with coronavirus to the moon. Yet again, there's another good, bad sci-fi novel in there. <laughs> not, not sure coronavirus would be very happy on the moon. Uh, let's hope it's not radiation uh, strength, um, strengthened from, uh, I, you know, that's, that's the hope. Uh, well, yeah, thank you for answering.